Thanks for coming to seminar. Is this our last seminar? No. No, okay. Not our almost <laughs> almost last. Sure, yeah, sure. Um, it's really hard to find it. Uh, seminar, um, but certainly not the least, uh, uh, Sheila Knappen is here. I've known Sheila since we were graduate students. Some of us have had more positive experience with others. <laughs> Yeah, so Sheila graduated from CFA, oh, sorry, from Harvard. What do you call it CFA? Is it wrong to call it CFA? Um, well, Harvard Advanced Degree. Oh, um, yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, and where she worked in the Antarctic class, and then she was at UT Austin as a fellow there, and then an SF fellow, Charlie Astrophysics Fellow. And uh, she is now, when did she move to UNC? Almost just have, 10 years ago. Almost, I should just have you introduce yourself at this point. <laughs> okay, so she was at UNC about 10 years ago, and she's here. And with thank you. Um, so I've already had a fun time here, and I'm looking forward to talking with some of you more. Um, so I'm going to be talking about two surveys, Resolve and Eco, that are designed to help us understand better the complete cosmic mass <coughs> census. Um, just to remind you, the cosmic mass census consists of invisible stuff. So this is a simulation of dark matter structure forming over cosmic time. Um, as well as visible stuff that traces that dark matter, hopefully, in the observable universe. Um, and this is a particularly thick filament. You can see filaments forming in that large-scale cosmic web. Um, and so it is punctuated by actually relatively large galaxies with bulges and disks like our Milky Way. Uh, but most of these structures are just uh, strung along with dwarf galaxies, tiny little faint things. And um, we're interested in the relationship of the baryons, the normal matter, to the dark matter and the, the structure that grows in both parts of the mass census. So outline of my talk, we'll start with the motivation design of Resolve and Eco, then talk about putting baryonic physics in that large-scale environmental context. Um, I'll spend a little time on re revisiting group dark matter halo estimation. It's kind of technical, but it's actually really important to understanding these things. And then talk finally about how, or does group evolution drive galaxy evolution. All right, so the basic picture that we're starting with is that groups and clusters are defined by sharing halos in the cosmic web. So here's the um, sort of, oh, whoops. Okay, so here's the time steps of growth of the cosmic web, and you can see the formation of what we call a dark matter halo, a node in the web, but inside it, the galaxies are not necessarily merged. So the things in, um, in those halos are groups of galaxies. Um, of course, some halos are still merging, but we're gonna focus on halos that are identified. Um, and there are some groups of one, so you'll hear me using this language um, so you can have an isolated central galaxy. It's just the, the language. It's just that we call it a group no matter how many things are in the halo. Um, so really I'm interested in how much does the baryonic physics of galaxy growth, where this is, of course, the standard astronomy use of the term baryons, which just means normal matter, um, gas fueling, star formation, AGM activity, et cetera. How, does, how much does that baryonic physics of galaxy growth follow the dark matter structure growth that we're seeing? Um, and that's basically the motivation for the RESOLVE survey. So RESOLVE stands for Resolve Spectroscopy of a Local Volume. It's all these black dots. These are all galaxies within the larger Sloan survey, which actually keeps going well beyond that plot, but you see a little bit of it in orange for context. So RESOLVE is uh, volume limited and it is unusually complete, much more complete than the parent Sloan survey. It's a census of dynamical stellar and gas mass plus star formation emerging from dwarf galaxy to cluster scales. By dwarf galaxy, I mean about 10 to the ninth solar mass uh, in baryons, stars plus cold gas. And it subtends about um, 50,000 cubic megaparsecs which is big enough, as you can see, to enclose a lot of walls, filaments, voids, contiguous large-scale structures. Uh, there's about 1,500 galaxies down to that completeness limit. And at these distances and arc seconds uh, is about 300 to 500 parsecs. So that's very interesting from the point of view of star formation. And the volume-limited design most crucially enables robust 
metrics of environment, especially groups, uh, because when you're volume limited down to a mass floor, you're getting the whole picture without the usual biases in astronomy. Now, the, res the resolved spectroscopy is actually referring to uh, both radio and optical spectroscopy to get the gas mass census as well as the kinematic census that goes along with uh, archival photometry for the most part. However, it is reprocessed, so it's uh, superior to the archival sources. Question. Yes. Roughly speaking, what fraction of the total mass is in faint dwarf galaxies that you can't detect? Because we keep detect. finding nearby dwarf galaxies by the Milky Way. Surely we can't find something that faint out at uh, 75 megaparsecs. So um, 10 to the 9th solar masses in baryonic mass doesn't really get into the regime of a lot of things that are wildly undetectable. Um, so the kind of ultra-faint galaxies you're talking about are orders of magnitude smaller in mass. Yeah, but if you're going to do um, dynamics, you need to make some guess as to what you know what's missing. Um, not really, because the, if, as long as you sample, and we'll get back to sampling, which is an issue, but as long as you sample your halo, all, all the objects in it should be responding to the same mass. But it's also true that just in general, um, mo most of the stellar mass in the universe is, like, I, I don't know the number, but uh, almost all of it is in galaxies more massive than 10 to the 9. Then that's the answer. All right, so cosmic variance and completeness are two issues for a survey like this. Um, as I mentioned, Resolve is about 50,000 cubic megaparsecs, and as you can see, it's a, a formidable observing challenge. Nonetheless, that's small by cosmological standards. So we have enclosed it in this survey called ECO, the Environmental Context Catalog. It's about 10 times larger. The stellar mass and environment metrics match Resolve. So this is, again, possible with, in, with um, archival data. That's in Moffat et al. 2015, and is available for anyone to play with. Um, it contains Resolve A, so you can see Resolve A here. Now this is, I was showing you before, a fan plot view going out in redshift. Now I'm showing you the on-sky view. So Resolve A is an equatorial strip, whereas ECO is pretty much the whole northern spring sky um, within the same redshift range, or actually a little bit larger. Um, and Resolve B, then, is, um, Oh, sorry, uh, back to ECO. Um, the key purpose of ECO is to calibrate cosmic variance, but it is uh, still, even though it's you know, not an area where we're getting new data, it is still more complete than Sloan, and that's because we've done a whole lot of cross-matching against uh, archival surveys. Uh, then back to Resolve B, this is now way more complete because Resolve B is the opposite equatorial strip, which is Stripe 82. Some of you may be familiar with Stripe 82, where Sloan went over and over and over and over. And so it's extra deep photometry, but it's also hyper complete in terms of redshift. Um, and we've actually even done our own redshift campaign to improve on it. So um, essentially, all the galaxies that are lost by Sloan, so dwarf galaxies, low surface brightness dwarfs, um, pairs of galaxies where the, there was a fiber collision issue, shredded spirals where each of the little shreds ended up falling below the limit for getting spectroscopy. All of those have been recovered, and you can see that in. Uh, is this not working anymore? Okay, my laser pointer just died. Anybody have a spare? So maybe more behind you. I'll go find you a real powerful one. Thank you. <laughs> Right. Meanwhile, I'll use my finger. <laughs> um, so, um, oh, okay. All right. So, this is the original in green um, Sloan distribution of magnitudes, actually absolute magnitudes in Resolve B, and the gray is what we have now. Um, now, the original slow limit is the solid line. What we've done is, in addition to the fact that down to that limit, we're now way more complete. You can see at the faint end, it's, it's really a factor of two, so huge improvement for the dwarfs. Um, but we've also just slightly extended what we accept for our analysis um, in, in the result of the extra deep region. And we use this region to construct empirical completeness corrections um, 
that we then use for ECO in Resolve A. So they're not based on modeling or fake data, they're actually based on the real completeness of Resolve B as a function of surface brightness or color or luminosity and so on. And the empirical completeness questions are larger than predicted based on simulations at all, uh, by Blanton at all. So um, just to give credit where credit is due before I go much further, because who knows if I'll finish the talk. <laughs> so um, a lot of what I'm presenting is the work of my, oh, they found another one, but thank you. Now I have triple that up. <laughs> um, so a lot of this work is by my former PhD students, Amanda Moffat, who is now at Vanderbilt, David Stark, who's now at Kathy IPMU, and Kathleen Eckert, who's now at UPenn. Um, also, these star folks have played a significant role, and all the others have contributed in some way. All right, so now moving on to putting baryonic physics in environmental context. So I think probably many people in this room are familiar with the traditional model of conversion of gas to stars in a galaxy, which is called the closed box model. Um, the idea is that the stars in equals the gas out, so, or not out, but consumed. Um, and the extended H1, which you can see in these pictures of dwarf galaxies, um, can be huge. These are H1 around these teeny tiny little optical galaxies. Um, and that is the reservoir, but it has to become dense molecular hydrogen to become the direct fuel for star formation. Um, and the notion in this closed box picture is that gas-rich galaxies, such as these isolated dwarfs, are inefficient gas consumers. That's why they're sitting in big puddles of gas. If you have a closed box model, then if you haven't turned your gas into stars, it must mean you're bad at turning gas into stars. Um, in this picture, galaxy mergers are mergers of two closed boxes. So two closed boxes come together, they're going to consume the gas in that collision, and they're, uh, in fact, extra efficient consumers. what I would call a closed box oh, sorry. Um, this is a closed box merger so you can see the bursts of star formation creating beautiful blue stars I could just make that <laughs> Yeah, it's Patrick Johnson. Yeah, it's Patrick Johnson. Right. It's his. Um, right. Okay. Okay, but anyway, sorry. The point was, <laughs> hopefully you didn't just miss it. That there was a huge burst of star formation, but now this thing is becoming red and dead because it is a closed box. There's no fresh gas coming in, and so actually in this picture, merging is is a potential cause of quenching. Um, now some of this red is dust, and they're going to rotate this in a minute so that you can see the intense red is actually caused by dust from the starburst. Uh, but also there's very little residual star formation and gas in this 
post-merger act. <coughs> All right. observations is that galaxies grow in tandem with the cosmic web. And so we have kind of a radically different perspective emerging. And I'll show you for contrast what I would call an open box merger simulation. So if I have a better time doing this one more thing. A universe full of gas. Can you see this or do we need to turn the lights down? Alright, so this gas is coming together in um, streams and we're going to see galaxies forming. You'll see some yellow and red kind of colors where there's um, stars actually forming. So now we have a bit of a galaxy there and just continuously in falling stuff. So now you have to picture this as just a tiny little part of the cosmic web but it's connected to the larger cosmic web. So there's not just one merger, there's many mergers. And actually, after each merger, you see fresh stuff is coming in. It's like being in this giant whirlpool, and more and more stuff is coming in. So even though mergers form stars, they certainly don't use up the gas. This is radically open box stuff always coming in. And of course, these are both theoretical, right? So we have to use real data to decide where in between we might be, or you know, what's what's the truth. Has anyone like looked at a cosmological simulation to understand like which one of those is closer to the truth? I don't know. I guess I should ask myself that question. Sounds like a good question. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm not claiming these are the most up to date, yeah. but just they're what I have for display. So. No, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so in that picture, there's the source term, which you just witnessed in the simulation, which is that the cosmic web is filled with invisible, mostly ionized gas, uh, which uh, we do know is there. It absorbs quasar light and makes up 80% of normal matter, we think. Um, but it's basically invisible, and uh, it's 10 to the fifth Kelvin WIM gas for the most part. WIM stands for warm, hot intergalactic medium. Um, and it cools onto galaxies, because 10 to the fifth Kelvin is actually relatively cool from the point of view of being able to cool on cosmic times. Um, and so that's what you witnessed. Um, and of course, there could be potentially um, the gas coming in in gas-rich objects as well. So we, we might want to say mergers could be a source term as well. Um, but the sink term, which you didn't witness in the simulation, is that as groups form, that cosmic gas um, is getting hotter. It's shock heating to higher temperatures. And so the wind that was just nicely flowing in and cooling um, turns into 10 to the 6, 7, 8 Kelvin gas. This is no longer going to cool quickly. And um, in fact, where the cosmic gas heats in, in galaxy clusters, it becomes more like a headwind, which you see here. So th this is a small group. This is Stefan's Quintet. And you see the shock structure here where gas is heating. But by the time you get to a cluster, you just have this huge a uh, bath of hot gas, and this is a galaxy falling into it, and you can see the cold gas in the galaxy getting ripped off, so that's stripping, but in addition, we have the slowing of cooling and refueling, so that's the sink term. Oh, and I'm not going to talk a lot about feedback, heating, or ejection of gas in this talk, but that we could also consider in that category. All right, so there's an expectation of key halo masses for gas accretion and heating in these group halos. Um, and this is kind of a cartoon picture. The cartoon picture comes out of 
just calculations of idealized spherically symmetric halos. You've already seen from the pictures I've shown you that halos are not idealized spherically symmetric things. But just as a starting point, um, for example, in the cold accretion calculations of Jekyll and Bernwein, you get um, what I've simplified as three distinct scales. Um, so at the threshold scale, which is around 10 to 11.3 or 4, you have just the beginnings of gas heating just within the inner halo, so out to about a tenth of the virial radius. Then at the so-called bimodality scale, which um, I'll show you in a minute, is actually linked to a galaxy scale that is known as the bimodality scale, so about 10 to the 12th solar mass halos, now you're getting heating out to the virial radius. And finally, the shutdown scale, so 10 to the 13.3 halos, these are large groups now, what we think of as, as large galaxy groups. That would be heating, I didn't show it here, but that would be heating out beyond the burial radius to two or three times the burial radius. The equivalent galaxy scales, you can see in this plot of galaxy mass versus group halo mass. So uh, the red is galaxy mass in just the stellar component. So those of you who work on galaxy evolution have probably seen the stellar mass halo mass plot a lot. Resolve allows us to plot the baryonic mass, halo mass relation as well. Um, and this is just halo mass from simple abundance matching. I'll come back to issues with that. Um, so if you just follow the path of the centrals, which are the big symbols, the satellites, of course, can have any mass they want. But if you just follow the path of the centrals, you can see that the equivalent central galaxy masses for the threshold by modality and shutdown group halo masses are 10 to the 9.8, 10 to the 10.5, and 10 to the 11.2. That 10 to the 10.5 is a somewhat famous 3 times 10 to the 10th galaxy mass scale for the bimodality. Um, and the velocities these correspond to are 120, 200, and 300. And here the claim to fame is more of the 120 kilometers a second, actually. Uh, people talk about a lot. So these scales, I know it's a lot of numbers. You should try to keep in your mind as you watch the rest of the talk, listen to the rest of the talk. So there's many mysteries and coincidences at these scales. Um, so one of them, um, as illustrated in this plot on the left, is the missing baryons problem. So this is a summary of the missing baryons problem from the Gaw as a function of the velocity of the structure or the structure halo mass. And this is the integrated structure baryonic mass, so again, just normal matter. Um, and then this black line is what you would expect from cosmology for a cosmic baryon fraction. And what you see is that the observed integrated baryonic mass in a halo drops below the expectation roughly at the threshold scale. Um, interestingly enough, this is also roughly the division between galaxies as individuals and groups of galaxies, and I'll come back to that. Um, what's particularly intriguing about the missing baryons is that we think that the missing baryons, or at least the best theoretical understanding is that it might be that WIM gas, that 10 to the fifth Kelvin gas. So that means we're missing gas exactly in the regime where galaxies become the most gas rich. So now here we're back to the galaxy scale, galaxy baryonic mass on the x-axis. And this is the Resolve gas census. This is the 21 centimeter survey for Resolve. So remember, this is complete and volume limited. This is everything there is. In addition, um, just a little plug for the hard work of the team, especially David Stark. Um, we have worked hard to get strong upper limits all the way down to dwarf galaxies. So that means we're not going to just accept um, a flux limited survey because you don't learn anything from a flux limited survey. If a galaxy has low stellar mass, we're going to keep observing it until we have an upper limit that's at least as strong as 5 or 10% of that stellar mass. So that is a lot of hard work has gone into this plot. But it's what you need in order to see that there's just this huge diversity, um, but um, the gas-dominated population, so this is where gas to stellar mass ratio exceeds one, is really emerging and becoming dominant below the threshold scale. Um, and so gas-dominated galaxies are precisely in the regime where gas is missing, and that's kind of weird. Um, Another thing, um, so, so this is actually, this plot is actually an update of a plot that I published in 2013 with um, the Nearby Field Galaxies survey. 
uh, 21 centimeter census, which is not volume limited, so this is much more powerful. Um, and one thing it shows that I just want to emphasize is that the gastroenterologist threshold scale is not the same as the bimodality scale. In the literature, a lot of times the two are conflated. They really are fundamentally different, uh, even though they're close together, less than a dex apart. And also, this emphasizes that mass does not drive gas content. The reason people think that mass drives gas content is because usually you have a flex limited survey and you have a line of upper limits falling like this. So you just get a diagonal line. If you're lucky that people even plot the upper limits, half the time people throw them away. So um, mass does not drive gas content, but there's something interesting happening at that threshold scale. Um, it's also been tied not only to gas richness, but even earlier it was tied to metallicity and the feedback changes in galaxies. It's essentially the emergence of the dwarf regime. Um, and it's also tied to dwarf galaxy shortages, for example, too big to fail in the field. You've seen work by Papa Sturgis based on the Alpha Alpha survey. And maybe also group formation. So, so I have a question. That. So that's yeah. almost a Tully Fisher relation, but not exactly. And the only difference is it's integrated structure. That's Sorry. Like the one on the oh, left. the one on the left. Yeah. Um, so it is integrated, yes. So that's the only so So at the bottom end of it, it is the baryonic Tully Fisher relation. Which is why it's been gone. That's actually okay. And the scatter, so the scatter on that relation is exactly the same as the scatter on the low end of the of what we typically see as the. So we are working really hard with Resolve to redo this for a volume limited complete sample. Although I think this is a beautiful illustrative plot, uh -huh. McGaw has, as you can see from the color coding, basically just cobbled together a bunch of archival samples that were selected with totally heterogeneous selection criteria. And there is absolutely no guarantee that the scatter here is in any way representative. Okay. <coughs> Can I ask you a quick question about that? I mean, yeah. you mentioned that the VIM might be able to account for the missing baryons down there. I mean, do people have the resolution to zoom in and actually see that in simulations? So, you know, there's a big, I mean, you need like a vector, almost an order of magnitude of your more gas in the warm, hot days than your cold days? Um, so, yes and no, I think. Um, the latest I heard, I was at a conference maybe a year ago um, where I was asking people like, um, I think I was talking with Risa Wexler and maybe some others, um, and they were saying that in principle they could, but they hadn't tried to resolve spatially where the whim is, because you really need to know whether it's in close in the galaxy where you yeah, would trace it with the dynamics or if it's further out. Right. So, and I, I, but I think they were saying that they could do it, they just hadn't. I'm not sure, or maybe it, since they had tried, maybe it's harder than they think, because everything's always harder than you think in yeah, research. Right. But. <laughs> um, all right, so continuing with the mysteries and coincidences of these scales, um, and coming back to this idea of group formation, so here is now for, Marco, for the larger catalog, group N versus group halo mass. So group N means the number of uh, members in the group down to twiddle 10 to the ninth in baryonic mass. Um, and uh, so this is n equals 1. I just broadened it with a random number generator so you can see all the points. And the uh, color scale represents the integrated group gas to stellar mass ratio. If you're paying attention, you know that we have only archival data for eco. So you'd be like, well, how'd you get that gas data? The answer is it's fake gas data. Um, so this is using the photometric gas fraction calibration of uh, my student. Katie, uh, based on um, earlier, I had done something that was a very simple color gas to solar mass ratio relation, and she has um, turned it into a, an approach where you actually get a gas to stellar mass ratio likelihood distribution. So, um, so now we have used those, and, um, and also the halo masses here are coming from halo abundance matching and friends of friends group finding. So, there's a lot of um, buried methodology in this plot that you may or may not want to buy, but um, the punchline is that in low end, so these are isolated galaxy groups, right? So it's, it's a group of one. Um, in these groups, we believe that the, uh, the gas content of the integrated group is greater than one. So these are gas dominated groups, not just galaxies. Um, and even, you can even see that when the n exceeds one. And then in between the threshold and bimodality scales, you get kind of a confetti of sometimes gas dominated, sometimes star dominated, and uh, obviously transitional. Then above the bimodality scale, as the group N is increasing, 
um, you are seeing increasingly just star dominated uh, groups. So that process of group formation then seems to be happening, especially across the threshold scale, because we're going from n equals one to multiple, but also in between the threshold and bimodality scales. Um, in a semi-analytic model, which is what I have here on the right, the, the thing that's happening between the threshold and bimodality scales is crazy gas physics. <laughs> All kinds of gas physics is going nuts in this regime. This is the ratio of the halo gas to the cold gas in galaxies in the SAM. Um, and you see that it's nice and well behaved, hits the threshold scale and goes berserk all over the place. This is presumably galaxies coming together in groups and then settles down in the large group and cluster regime. Um, there, in that model, there are all kinds of transitions and feedback. Again, I said I'm not going to talk a lot about feedback, but it's transitioning from star formation to AGN feedback between these key scales as well. So there's just a whole lot going on. What we're calling uh, this regime in here where the groups seem to be forming is the nascent group regime. So where you have two, three, four things, that's a nascent group and that's where the gas physics is going crazy. Um, by the way, this plot on the right is using true group halo masses. The SAM in principle knows where the dark matter halos are and what are the true groups. So this brings me to revisiting group dark matter halo es mass estimation because that's really critical to understanding the physics. So um, the starting point for this is group halo abundance matching. Uh, this is the easiest thing you can do and so it's the most common thing that is done. Um, this assumes a monotonic relationship between the dark matter halo mass and some group integrated baryonic trace. So for example, let's talk about luminosity. Uh, so we would assign halo masses by matching the observed and theoretical cumulative distribution function. So the cumulative luminosity function and the cumulative halo mass function. And we match these from the top down on space density. So we're essentially saying from the top down, if, if the space density of dark matter halos at least this massive is blah, then we go over and find an integrated luminosity level where the cumulative density in the universe, space density in the universe, is going to be that same value. And assign all the halos with that luminosity, that integrated luminosity, the same halo mass from the cumulative halo mass function. So um, I'll just mention as an aside, because it'll keep coming up in plots that I'm showing, that when you perform HAM using the R band luminosity, that's equivalent roughly to using the cold baryonic mass, which is to say the stars plus cold gas in galaxies like H1 gas. Um, and that's just an observational fact, which um, I put in my 2013 paper. But um, this um, basic point is that this process is suppressing diversity in the hot to cold baryonic content. Because we're basically seeing whatever the baryonic content is, it's only going to be traced by something observable. It could be luminosity, it could be baryonic mass, it could be, but baryonic mass in the sense of cold gas plus stars, not, not unobservable WIM gas. Or it could be um, stellar mass. It's often done with stellar mass. But no matter how you slice it, the thing that you match on is not going to include the hot component, the hot baryonic component. So it suppresses that diversity. Um, now, if you actually perform it, this is uh, our Cam halo mass for both eco and resolve in one plot uh, versus, or sorry, log cold baryonic mass versus cam halo mass. So this is the integrated cold baryonic mass. And, and so obviously it's monotonic. Um, then you look over at what you have in the SAM. Um, now, out here at true halo masses in the cluster or large group range, the hot to cold baryonic mass ratio uh, and now cold baryonic mass includes stars. Now this is different from the previous plot. So uh, the hot to cold baryonic mass ratio looks very well behaved out here. So in the large group and cluster regime, it was totally fine um, to assume mon monotonicity and ignore that diversity in that ratio. But you can see that it's starting to get much more diverse at lower mass uh, in the SAM. And so you might worry about that assumption. 
Um, so another issue with HAM is that trends with halo masks are going to depend on what you used to match on the HAM tracer. So for example, now this is um, two examples of halo abundance matching. Instead of using luminosity, here we've used stellar mass and baryonic mass. And this is just a comparison where we're using HAM as defined by either stellar mass or baryonic mass. In these two panels, we're comparing centrals and satellites with stellar mass, and here centrals and satellites with baryonic mass. Um, so the plots are the gas to stellar mass ratio versus the galaxy mass. And it's in, uh, the colors are in regimes of halo mass. So these are the significant regimes I just described to you. So the blue is below the threshold scale. The green is between the threshold and bimodality scale. So that's the nation group regime in green. Um, and uh, orange is large groups, so 12 to 13. And greater than 13 is starting to become more like clusters. Um, so you see that the central trends here are entirely dictated by what was used to perform the ham. So uh, if you perform stellar mass uh, halo abundance matching, then by definition, because the central is the most massive thing, and when you add up all the mass in the halo, it's going to be dominated by the mass of the central, then almost by definition, not exactly, because you do have satellites, but almost by definition, you end up with that a more massive central will have a lower gas to stellar mass ratio. And so you get this perfect trend. However, if you do your halo abundance matching with baryonic mass, that's no longer built in the same way. Now you have a built-in gap. Um, so you automatically, if you have a, uh, a fixed baryonic mass, but the uh, gas, sorry, if you have a fixed, If you, oh no, this, this actually should be built in um, in the sense that the gas to stellar mass ratio can be higher without changing the baryonic mass. You're just changing the balance of gas and stars. So at fixed baryonic mass here, we actually still expect these to line up. So this was actually an interesting little gap here that we weren't necessarily expecting, and it actually lines up kind of with the threshold scale. So what I meant to show you to complete the argument I was just making was there's another panel where we mix and matched, where we did the um, baryonic mass ham, but then showed on the x-axis stellar mass. And then you get weird cross effects, but I don't have that plot here, so never mind that. Um, so quality. Qualitatively, though, the satellite trends are not built in in the same way the central trends are. So the satellite trends um, all show, including the extra plot I didn't show you that doesn't really make sense, um, all show reduced gas to stellar mass ratio as you go towards higher halo mass regimes. Now, I haven't shown the blue line because in that re regime, there are almost no satellites. Remember, that's below the threshold scale, so almost all galaxies are centrals. However, I'm just going to put them now on the same. So now you can see that if you are wanting to compare dwarfs in this mass regime to what they would be in isolation, you see that in a statistically significant sense, the gas depletion starts in the orange, which is above 10 to the 12th. So in that nation group regime, it's not yet statistically significant depletion, but above 10 to the 12th, you definitely have the gas depletion, which could be um, due to hot gas heating above 10 to the 12th, which remember was the bimodality scale where we're expecting hot gas heating out to the burial radius. Okay, so that was a lot. Does anyone have a question on that? I guess in the end, to me, it's yeah. a lot of yeah. So what, what are we supposed to take away from this? You're supposed to take away from this what, what I said in the title, that the trends with halo mass are built in for the centrals by the ham tracer, whereas for the satellites you actually can still learn something because they're not dominating the assignment of the ham. So you can't, you can't say something quantitative about the satellites because still you can see these two plots are not identical, right? 
And so you, you still have to be careful that if you do halo abundance matching on stellar mass or baryonic mass, you get a different quantitative answer. But at least qualitatively, we can say that gas depletion is real regardless of which way we do the ham. But anything that you would claim for centrals is going to be just completely dictated by the ham process. Yeah. Do you get a sense, or sorry. No, I, I said I'd do that. Yeah, no, it's an actually interesting point. Do you get a sense, though, if the satellites are just having, or is it, is it when you say the starvation process is going to longer able to create new gas they would if they were just healed or galaxy or their gas is actually being blown out by the hot halo? Is that what you mean by hot gas? Um, so I'm, I'm, for the moment, being agnostic as to how the hot gas gets there. So I showed you one picture in the Stefan's Quintet where it's actually through shocking in the merging process. Another possibility is what we said, feedback actually blowing gas out. Um, so there's a number of different potential sources for gas heating, even just gravitational heating. Sure. So I'm, I'm, for the moment, just saying hot gas. Yeah. Probably all due to group yeah, yeah. formation processes. So it's all related to groups. Okay, so then the question that we asked ourselves was, you know, we're kind of frustrated with ham. It's easy to do, but it seems like it's not maybe teaching us as much as we yeah, would like. Yeah, that's basically what I was trying to ask you in a kind of a polite way. So should this either, do we actually do it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so then can dynamical masses give us more information was our question. And uh, of course, Resolve is all about dynamics, and we have a very complete, extra complete sample. So you know, we would hope we can sample the group dynamics. But still, here's the original plot I showed you. This was with ham halo mass versus cold baryonic mass. And here's dynamical halo mass, where you need at least five things. And even with five things, you're kind of feeling a little bit iffy about the process, right? So we're losing most of our sample. That kind of stinks, right? So that's not ideal, and we're also losing the nation group regime, right? <laughs> so that, that's pretty stinky. So what we worked on was what we call a hybrid dynamical approach. Uh, this is the actual hybrid dynamical halo mass versus cold baryonic mass. Um, and for n greater than 15, it's pure dynamical. 7 to 15, it's stacked and pure blended smoothly down to a pure stacked regime at n equals 6. So what do I mean by stacked? I mean, we take all of the groups and we bin them up um, by integrated luminosity, so that would have been the ham mass tracer, and radius. So here now density is coming in. Um, and in bins of luminosity and radius, <coughs> we stack together all of the objects in all of those groups and measure the dispersion of all of them and the radius of all of them and get a single mass that we then assign to all of the objects in that bit. So that's a stacked dynamical mass. Um, then below three, in three to five, we blend the stacked dynamical mass with the ham mass. And that's because the stacked mass is starting to become dodgy, but at the same time, it does have potentially some independent information in it. And one to two, it's just ham. You will notice it's fatter, and that's because we added noise so that there wouldn't be a sudden um, because ham pretends like you know there's no scatter in anything, so we added noise so that it would smoothly go down. Wait, well, you're hoping that you're going to take the best of both worlds. Yes. How do you know you're not taking the worst? Well, um, I mean, I guess that's up to you to decide. But when you stack um, multiple objects, you do improve your statistics for measuring dispersion. So that's. When you say stack, you're just saying you're stacking the dynamics. You're taking all. <coughs> yeah, so if you had three groups of three objects, now you have nine objects. But you're still pinning them by our band or something. So, so the way those three groups got combined is yeah. because they were in the same bin of integrated luminosity and radius. So the hope is that um, it radius which you know, we tried a bunch of different things and radius had the strongest signature. Um, the hope is that radius is somehow related, density or compactness is somehow related to evolutionary state and thus to the ratio of that hot gas that's not being included to the cold baryonic tracer. There's also the possibility that it's just artifacts from your friends or friends all over. Right? Um, well, let me come back to that question. 
Okay, so I'm going to come back to it in about like a minute. Um, so, <laughs> so we're going to see how effective this was by looking at uh, the baryonic collapse efficiency. And what I mean by baryonic collapse efficiency is modeled on some work by Lathod et al. in 2012 where they looked at the integrated stellar mass, that's this, as a function of halo mass. And so this is the, the fraction of stellar mass over halo mass. So, um, and they talked about the sort of maximum galaxy for formation efficiency was at this peak, which you can see is pretty close to the bimodality scale. Um, and to first order, we can just make the equivalent cold baryonic plot now with resolve. So stars plus cold gas. Um, and in between the two scales, you see it is actually already different because of the inclusion of gas. We can basically say that if we want to call this, um, this is now the group integrated cold baryon fraction, that is the collapsed baryons, right? That's the baryons that are in galaxies as opposed to hanging out in the halo. And so you can see that actually it's pretty much flat between the threshold and bimodality scales, whereas for stellar mass it was rising. So that's basically the conversion of gas to stars that you're seeing. As groups form, they form first at the threshold scale, they convert gas to stars, and as they exit the bimodality scale, they're now you know, full-fledged star-dominated groups. Um, so that seems to tell a nice, pretty story, and this is with the ham halo mass. All right, so this is, on the left, the same plot as this, but with the hybrid dynamical halo mass. Um, and here um, we're looking at uh, the diversity is you know, much greater. Definitely the scatter is much greater. Um, should we have expected more diversity? I would argue yes, because we were ignoring the hot gas component, which could have arbitrary ratios. But you can also compare to Galform to say, should we have expected it based on our theoretical understanding? And the answer in Galform is yes. Uh, so this is the true halo mass, and this is the group integrated cold baryon fraction. You can see that these two really have a lot less in common than these two. So the diversity um, is expected. And I would argue the false ham result is also expected, because what we did is we took the Galform simulation and we created a mock catalog from it. So we performed our exact same friends of friends group finding, our exact same halo abundance matching on the Galform outputs. And that's what you get. So all of a sudden, it's all cleaned up. It looks like your ham result. It's not real. Okay, this is to answer your question. It's ham and friends of friends creates this. Now, there is a little spur here, which is another issue that has to do with deficiencies in their treatment of dust corrections, but that's a detail. So does that answer your question? Somewhat. Do you want to rephrase well, it? We'll come back to it. Okay, sure. Uh, wait, sorry, I, I can't let it go. So the, um, because it's really interesting, because there is some bias that really just causes everything to form the sequence. I guess it's because the ham kind of forces you to have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Because it, it's, it's ignoring hot variants. It's, okay. it's assuming okay. there's no diversity in the right. hot to cold or the hot to collapse right. variant. Right in that, uh, I forget what that middle one was called, that, 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 that threshold area where it's, it's right there that you see that. Right. Okay. So, so that group assembly stage, that's what you're talking about. Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, and this, by the way, is the uh, completeness limit. So, you know, we're only just barely getting there, but enough to see that this is a real issue. Cool. I guess partially what I was curious about was. Uh, I'm not really clear why why radius should matter physically. Um. So I guess if, so. If you're wanting to understand diversity at fixed um, integrated luminosity in hot gas content, then you just try a bunch of things, right? Yeah. So we tried um, we tried radius. We tried um, the diversity in color. So we defined something called color gap, which was like this color of the central versus the second uh, member of the group. We, we just tried a bunch of things that we thought might indicate evolutionary status or, or structure or something that might affect relative hot to collapsed or hot to cold variants. And that 
radius was the one that worked best. Yeah, like, I was wondering if, like, in, in your friend's friend's algorithm, like, if you if you link this other galaxy that's out here that's actually not part of the group, but it's linked by your friend's friend's oh, well. algorithm, then that will introduce the dependence on radius. Because uh, all not sudden, really, because the radius is defined in a fairly robust way. So it's, um, it's actually a, a technique we adapted from uh, the gamma team where they were using, uh, essentially it's like a percentile. So it has some of the same robustness that like a median would just to speak intuitively. I mean, you can look at the, the details, but um, I believe that, um, you can never say his name right, but Robotham? I don't know. <laughs> Invented it. I had a student who said robot ham, and so now I can't get it out of my head. Yeah, but you can spell it. Sorry? You can spell it. I can spell it. <laughs> anyway. Um, so just to quickly show you how this might affect some other things you know and love, that here's the galaxy mass halo mass relation. Again, uh, red is the stellar one, which is, sorry, it's obscured underneath the baryonic one, sorry. But the baryonic is what's new, right? Because Resolve can, can do this for the first time. Um, so here's the ham galaxy mass halo mass relation, and here's the hybrid dynamical. Um, however, uh, just huge caveat on this whole thing, I just want to show you that the, um, you know, well, you can see there from where I put the dashed line, the vast majority of resolve is still in the regime where ham is dominating our answer for what the halo mass is. So we've only slightly pushed down our ability to use dynamics, not as much as we'd like. Um, here's if I were to just restrict to stacked dynamics, um, here's what I would get. And you can see that below that dashed line, it's already just kind of falling apart. It's not making a lot of sense. So um, unfortunately, the most interesting groups, the low end groups, these nation groups, are the least tractable. Even with stacking, we're having a lot of trouble with them. So another approach that we're trying, um, this comes out of the astrostatistics program that James and I were in um, is applying hierarchical Bayesian modeling to better uh, measure the dynamics of low end groups. So the basic concept of hierarchical Bayesian modeling is that um, if you have, like we are fortunate to have, a complete and volume limited survey, then the answers to the values of all the dispersions of all your groups represents your prior, that is your probability distribution function for galaxy group dispersions. So how do you feed that back on itself? Well, there's a mathematical consistency, essentially, that hierarchical Bayesian modeling requires between, if you like, the emergent prior, the distribution of measured velocity distribution, sorry, measured, the distribution of measured velocity dispersions should agree with the individual measurements. And so um, this is results with a mock eco, because right now we're just testing this method, trying to convince ourselves we understand what it's doing and uh, that it's doing the right thing. So this is a dark matter only simulation populated with the conditional luminosity function put together by our uh, collaborators, Victor Calderon and Andreas Willand. On the left, you have no hierarchical modeling at all. So this is just Traditional, we're going to measure each group separately. They're not going to have any influence on each other's measurements. We're doing Bayesian fits with a student's T group velocity distribution. There's a flat prior and log sigma. The gapper, by the way, is what people have been doing for some decades. So just a traditional method for measuring group velocity dispersions that people think is robust. And you can see the true groups, of course, because this is a map catalog, we know the true group velocity dispersion. So the true group velocity dispersions are in blue. The gapper gets the red line, which agrees at large sigma. So the gapper is well optimized at large sigma, but then it's you know pretty crappy. And this simple Bayesian modeling, which is to say each group treated separately, gives pretty much the same answer as the gapper. Maybe it's actually a little bit worse um, at the high end, but that's also because we're preserving the full distribution. So mostly because I mean you're at low end, so the low the small halos is only the few objects. It's not just a few objects thing, it's also a projection thing. So the projection effects just brutalize you at low end. You don't, if you just happen to have, like if you have three things in a halo yeah. and, and you just happen to have projection effects that kill those velocities, there's not enough things to kind of bring it back. Yeah. 
So, um, and and so even um, even though uh, so so this is log two minutes. So this is ten kilometers a second, um, and even though we could put a prior, you know that you know set some floor on how low sigma would go, uh, we feel like then we wouldn't be learning anything. So what we've done instead um, is this hierarchical Bayesian modeling. So the prior emerges from the full sample. It's the same basic function, students t, and you see that the um, hierarchical model is a much better answer. So now it does as well as the gapper does at the high dispersion end, but it actually does better at the low dispersion end. So we're improving. This is work in progress. We're trying to see if we can get it even better, but it's already a big improvement. Um, so true comes from the simulation, true comes from the simulation, right? True comes from the simulation. So it's actually like you're, you're you know what the exact table is. You know basis. what the three D dispersion should be. You know the, the uh, you know the, the mass of this. You know the halo mass. Of this. We know the halo mass from which we have determined the true dispersion. Yeah. Wait, don't you go the other way around in observations though? Yes. Right, but the true is what you're asking about. So, so oh, yeah, you can continue. I'll, I'll ask. So, it. so the the green and red are measurements applied to the mock catalog, but because it's a mock catalog, you know the true. The true and what? the blue is the true. The true dispersion or the true signal? true dispersion. Oh, the true mass. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, this axis is dispersion, but it is directly derived from the mass. What are you saying? You're going from the other way, where you have a bunch of observations, a bunch of identified groups, and however. And you try to derive a halo from that. How do you go back to truth? Yeah, that's a lot harder. I think so. I think that's but then you're going to be mixing things that are wider range. Because it's like the mass, the halo mass that's all flavored. So like, like the, the halo mass is the ultimate here. It's key systematic here, right? The dark matter. The, the, the dark matter halo. Like, serious. what's the halo mass? The dark matter mass. <coughs> the dark matter. Yeah. That's like the big systematic here, right? Um. Well, so the dark matter halo mass is used to determine the blue line. Right, that is a fixed table mass. What is the distribution of velocity? Yeah. Okay. No, this no. is this is all of the halos in the whole Mach Eco. This is this is like you know, oh, okay, so you thousands and thousands of galaxies. Okay, so I'm sorry, so I missed. Yeah, yeah. This is a Mach okay. Eco. This okay. is the whole. It's it's down to a halo mass floor, or well, actually down to a galaxy mass floor because it's a Mach Eco and Eco is limited at galaxy mass. So down to a galaxy mass floor. This is the true velocity dispersion function of that mock catalog. Yes, of the simulated mock catalog. So it's it's what we should get in a perfect world where we have 3D information and statistics. We're all working on our favor. We would recover the blue line. If you cheated and used 6D information, would you get back to the true? The if you animal? cheated and sorry, use 6D instead of 3D. So you see. 6D. So you like all, all parts of phase space. If we use the radius information, is that like you X Y Z E X Y Z, um, like would you get that? Would you get closer to the true distribution? I, I we haven't tried that. Like I said, we're actually still optimizing the velocity dispersion. What I was thinking of doing, which is maybe sort of like what you're saying but different, um, is separately doing the radius distribution function so that we would separately have hierarchically assigned sigmas and hierarchically assigned radii, and then we could actually go back to our binning <laughs> and, and redo the binning with these improved radii and sigmas. But I don't know, we could try what you're saying. You can, you can do hierarchical modeling with sort of multiple fits going on at once, but it's a little bit... I'm just curious, yeah. like, the difference between the true and the model is just the projection effect and not necessarily the model. Um, so the model is already projected as a what the 2D dispersion should be, but that's just a three house or yeah. Well, maybe we can continue using that um, yeah. talk. <laughs> and maybe we could have afterwards because I know some students have classes to attend. Okay. So we are now finally getting to the final point in the talk. Does group evolution drive galaxy evolution? Um, so first of all, we have a zeroth order answer of yes. Um, which comes from looking at cosmic variance in the galaxy mass function, not group, but galaxy. So this is from Eckerd et al. 2016. Um, so we separately looked at ECO, which remember contains resolve A, and resolve B, which is an independent volume and rather small, so subject to a fair amount of cosmic variance. And the ECO 
um, galaxy mass function is in orange. This is actually the baryonic mass function is in orange. The resolved mass function is in green, and you can see that the green and orange are not consistent with each other. However, we can use the frequency distribution of group masses together with the mass function in eco for different group mass regimes and reconstruct this blue line is what the eco survey would predict that the galaxy mass function should be for result based on the number of groups it has of different masses. And it's a pretty close fit. The blue line almost goes through the green line. So to zero with order, cosmic variance in the galaxy mass function can be explained by the distribution of groups of different masses. Um, that's because the galaxy mass function looks completely different in different group mass regimes. So this is it broken down. So the gray line is what you're used to seeing, nice sort of Schechter function type shape for the overall mass function, but now broken down into these physically significant mass regimes. Um, so the blue is, is our isolated sub-threshold scale. The green is the nation group regime. Orange is large groups. This is resolved via eco, obviously much smaller error bars. And we also add the cluster regime. Uh, so the, the galaxy mass function as broken down by environment is far from a Schechter function. Um, it does somewhat look like the halo plus subhalo mass function. So this is Bolshoi. Um, so these are in those same halo mass regimes. And you get this sawtooth structure because centrals are more common than satellites. But it is definitely, you know, it's meant to go sharply upwards. <laughs> um, and here, here it is just broken down into parent halos and subhalos. Um, so it kind of looks like that, but really kind of not. Um, and particularly, you can see in the green, the nation group regime, it's just not looking a whole lot like this. Um, so what we're inferring from this is that there's some kind of satellite destruction going on during group formation. All right, so we also see evidence, in addition to the loss of just counts in the mass function, we see evidence of group halo mass dependent gas heating. Um, so this is the group integrated baryonic mass function. And the blue is the raw group integrated baryonic mass function. Uh, so that's just cold baryons uh, by group mass. But if we add back the hot baryons, we get the red line. That's the X-ray hot gas correction as a function of group mass, um, which was calibrated by Giorgini et al. using massive groups. Um, and then the green line is our attempt, and this is definitely hand wavy, I fully admit, to put in a dwarf cold gas correction. And that's because um, both baryonic Tully Fisher relation studies and um, some Herschel type studies and so on have indicated there may be a gas component that's fairly significant that we're not detecting through 21 centimeter data. Um, so we put a factor of two multiplier on the H1 mass for just the low mass gas dominated galaxies and that gives you the green. So together those corrections almost make a parallel line with the black which is the dark matter halo mass function. So it's almost like you're recovering a constant baryon fraction but it's the wrong baryon fraction because the black line is already adjusted by the universal baryon fraction. So all of the halos have lower baryon fraction than we expect. And it turns out this is seen before. So for example, the Lothod work I quoted before has seen this. And um, there's actually some work out there, people trying to explain uh, why this is going on, which I can talk to you about later. Um, but there is potentially above and these vertical lines are marking completeness limits. And so there is potentially still a deficit above what we think our completeness limit is. And it's, interestingly, coming in below the threshold scale. So potentially that's a WIM contribution. So WIM would be the cooler gas correction at the bottom. Um, hot gas at the top would be what we're seeing with Giodini. All of this may leave you wondering, well, you know, how much do we really know about this whim? So I'm going to now show you a very different line of reasoning that kind of reinforces interpreting it this way. And that is coming from star formation histories. So 
the punchline of this plot is that whim accretion fuels gas-dominated dwarfs. That is to say, remember gas-dominated dwarfs are basically galaxies and halos below the threshold scale. So how do I know this? Well, bear with me, this is going to take a little bit of explaining. So first of all, we derive the fractional stellar mass growth rate. That is defined as the stellar mass formed in the last big year divide, divided by the stellar mass formed in all previous big years. It's important that this is not a specific star formation rate because a specific star formation rate would divide uh, the stellar mass formed by the total stellar mass. The total stellar mass would include the numerator, so a specific star formation rate asymptotes. When you have a rapidly growing object, a specific star formation rate becomes useless. It asymptotes. So we're defining this fraction differently. It's the same information, but instead of being x over x plus y, it's x over y. All right? So it's just mathematically different. That's all. So that's the y-axis, fractional stellar mass growth rate. It's logarithmic here. So 1 here is where the amount of mass formed in the last big year is equal to all previously formed mass. So it doubled in the last big year at this 1 value. Um, now, the FSMGR tracks past star formation, but the x-axis, gas to stellar mass ratio, tracks present fuel. That's the current gas to stellar mass ratio. So the existence of this really tight correlation should be a little bit disturbing to you. And what's even more disturbing is that closed box model tracks, which are these orange lines, don't go through the data at all. So we cannot reproduce the star formation histories and gas contents of galaxies with closed box models. Well, of course, I kind of set you up for this, right, with all my talk about open boxes. So the data require cosmic accretion. And moreover, what's really cool is these are the gas-dominated galaxies to the right of one. So basically, it's this population of gas-dominated dwarfs that are the ones that are doubling their mass or more. So they are not, it, it, it's not fair to call them inefficient. They may be inefficient in some technical sense about the detailed, um, the details of star formation, surface density, and so on. But they are the fastest growing things in the universe. And it's very important that when we call them inefficient, that fact gets lost. They are doubling their stellar mass on giga year time scales. Um, since we're running out of time, I'll just say that you see different answers in a lot of historical studies because we have superior photometry. Um, a lot of the things that people rely on, for example, calibration by Salim et al. 2007 for the UV star formation rate, are based on catalog photometry. If I run that catalog photometry through my code, I will get a much lower um, fractional stellar mass growth rate. All right. So dwarfs um, in these sub-threshold scale halos, I've just argued, are growing really fast based on star formation metrics. In addition, we saw it before, these are the things right here below this green line, and we saw there is a slope there. Now, we're, you know, we're barely getting it, but we are getting it, um, that there is an upward slope, which means, if you think about what this plot is telling you, this is the fraction of the baryons that are in galaxies. So if that's rising, then the fraction of baryons in galaxies is growing, which means the galaxies are growing. Collapsed stuff is getting into galaxies faster than the halo mass is growing. Okay, so this little bit of upslope up to the threshold scale is where galaxies are growing faster than their halos. And this has actually been seen before. So there's a Mostert et al. 2013 paper that used abundance matching over multiple epochs in redshift and saw that low mass galaxies are actually ramping up. So the punchline of all of this is that group formation ends rapid galaxy growth. And of course, ultimately, that ends with lots of hot gas. Um, now, I think I've answered the question, does group formation drive galaxy evolution? Mostly in the affirmative. But I did just want to throw out some caveats. And I will, because I'm running out of time, just say that there are a bunch of caveats. They're all published in a paper by um, David Stark from 2016. Sorry, this is my Stark, not other Starks you may know. Um, there are a lot of D Starks in astronomy, but this is David Stark, my former graduate student. It's a beautiful paper. Multiple ways in which larger scale 
structures than groups matter. Things like flybys matter, large scale structure matters, large scale density matters, and affects gas content. But since I'm out of time, I will move on. And this is my summary. Um, so please use our data. Motivate, this is just the same points that have been our outline. Um, we have the data online and more is coming. Um, threshold by modality and shutdown scales, I hope you'll remember, are three distinct scales, particularly threshold by modality. Watch out for HAM. And does group evolution drive Gaussian evolution? Yes, probably through gas heating, stripping, and merging. And unfortunately, though, we need to find a way to get better dark matter halo masses for the smallest groups in order to make real progress here. So that's, that's my talk. And for people who might talk with me later this afternoon, this is other stuff I didn't talk about that the Resolve team is working on. So you can, if you see a resonance with your research, ask me about it later. Otherwise, we should let Sheila get some food in her before she goes south. Any? Right. Yeah, so very quickly. So, I guess your um, the halo masses that you infer from abundance matching must be different than what you get from stacking the dynamics for the lower mass groups. So, do you have any explanation for that or any thoughts for why that might be? Again, just that huge diversity in the collapsed baryons versus what's in the halo, because that's exactly the regime where groups are forming. So all kinds of really complex and non-spherical physics is going on, right? I mean, you can imagine accretion streams coming on one hand while there's shock heating in another direction. And just like, it's, it's not, I wouldn't expect those small groups to be self-similar. And we saw that in the group integrated gas content that it's just confetti in that regime. So if you did, if you used an abundance matching algorithm that took scatter into account, then maybe that would solve the problem. Well, in the sense of reproducing the scatter, yes, but not in the sense of learning what's the physics and actually trying to follow it. Okay, well, let's see Sheila again.